I think it's clear that this seven-year period is a time of wrath. It's a time in which God will pour out His wrath upon the world. A time when He will refine and bring Israel to its knees. So there's two purposes going to be accomplished with this seven-year tribulation. God will pour out His wrath upon the world of the unbeliever. God will, through testing and trial, bring the nation Israel to its knees. So that by the time you get to the end of the 70th week of Daniel, the nation as a nation, not every single Jew, but there will be a mass turning of the Jews to Jesus Christ as Messiah in anticipation of His second coming. Now, note in the book of Revelation, chapter 6. When you come into chapter 6, we have moved into the 70th week of Daniel. Chapter 6 to 19 deal with events of the 70th week of Daniel, that seven-year period, climaxing with the return of Christ to earth in Revelation 19. That marks the conclusion of the 70th week of Daniel, the judgments that will take place, and the preparation for the establishing of the millennium. Look in verse 16 of Revelation 6. In this period of time, because of the judgments that will be taking place, men will cry out on the earth, verse 16, They said to the mountains and to the rocks, Fall on us, hide us from the presence of Him who sits on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of their wrath has come, and who is able to stand? It's a time of the pouring out of the wrath of God that will climax at Armageddon. And the climax of His wrath. And you see here, people crying out in terror. We have just a little glimpse of this with the earthquakes we've experienced on the West Coast recently. A reminder of how confident, self-assured, cocky, if you will, people can be quickly reduced to abject terror when God shakes the earth for a brief 30 seconds. All of the bravado is gone. Think of what would have happened if He shook it for 30 minutes. Wouldn't be anything left but a little bit of powder out there to blow around. When God pours out His wrath, uh, the great, the mighty men will be reduced to terror, crying out for cover. Chapter 11. I'll make you carried away here. <laughs> Chapter 11, verse 18. And the nations were enraged, and your wrath came. And the time came for the dead to be judged. You see, we move into the 70th week of Daniel. We are on a course that will climax in judgment. That's the climax of the 70th week of Daniel. Personal judgment and the establishment of the kingdom. It's a time of wrath. Look over in chapter 14, verse 10. Speaking about the judgment that will result in hell. Those who come under judgment in the tribulation. He will drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which mixed in full strength in the cup of His anger. These coming through the tribulation. Unbelievers cast into hell. The wrath of the tribulation is anticipatory. So you have the wrath of God, if you will, during this seven year period, building to the climax. That will be the climax with the sentencing of men and women to an eternal hell when Christ returns to judge the world. Look in chapter 14, verse 19. And the angel swung his sickle to the earth, gathered the clusters from the vine of the earth, threw them into the great winepress of the wrath of God. We're coming to Armageddon. But you see, Armageddon is within the confines of the 70th week of Daniel. It's part of that period. And the climax of that period, if you will. Some post-tribulationists, such as Robert Gundry, try to end the seven-year tribulation and he tries to make it less than a full seven-year period and then make the wrath of God happen after that. I believe he becomes totally inconsistent with the passages that he has to deal with. We'll get into that as we move through Revelation. Chapter 15, verse 1. I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels who had seven plagues which are the last, because in them the wrath of God is finished. You see, this has been a time of God's wrath, and now it's going to be brought to completion. It's building like a storm. You say, boy, this storm is bad, but it's going to get worse. You say, this storm has gotten worse, yes, but it's not as bad as it's going to get. That's what's happening through this period of time. So you come to the final judgments, the bold judgments, and they are the worst. It's been a building time. Verse 7 of chapter 15. 
And of the four living creatures, one of the four living creatures gave to the seven angels seven golden bowls full of the wrath of God. So you see, it's time of wrath. Chapter 16, verse 1. The end of the verse, they pour out the seven bowls of the wrath of God onto the earth. Verse 19, the end of the verse, to give her the cup of the wine of His fierce wrath. Judgment taking place that will take place on Babylon, quoted in chapter 17 and 18. So within that seven year period, we move toward its climax. And then chapter 19, verse 15, with the return of Christ personally to earth. The end of the verse, he treads the winepress of the fierce wrath of God the Almighty. This seven year tribulation is a time of God's wrath poured out upon unbelieving people. Climaxing in its fullest intensity at Armageddon in the closing days or weeks as some would believe since the word for uh, the Battle of Armageddon is the campaigns of Armageddon at the climax of that seven year period. Jesus said that He Himself personally by His intervention will bring an end to those events. In Matthew 24, if He didn't, there would be no flesh left alive. So at the time of wrath, we have that fixed in our mind. Okay, now we can back up to Revelation 3.10. Revelation chapter 3, verse 10. This is probably... The single, clearest, most important verse on the timing of the rapture in the New Testament. You see, much of what the Bible talks about is the return of Christ. It talks much about the return of Christ. It talks about the rapture of the church. But the Bible does not go into a great deal of detail specifically in giving us a timeline of those events. So all we have to do is study the events that the Bible prophesies, then we put them together and back up. To recognize, well, when will the rapture occur in relation to the seven-year tribulation and so on? And there's a promise given to the church at Philadelphia. And remember, these churches are representative, not just literal churches of John's day, but representative of all churches down through church history. And here is the church as it is faithful before God, giving the pro- given the promise of God. Verse 10, because you have kept the word of my perseverance. This church has persevered and been faithful in accord with the Word of God. I also will keep you from the hour of testing. That hour which is about to come upon the whole world to test those who dwell upon the earth. Now, don't you know something? This hour of testing that's coming is going to come upon the whole world. So this is not isolated testing, the trials of God, but this is going to encompass the whole world. And it is particularly focused upon those who dwell upon the earth. There's common agreement here, whether you're a pre-tribulation or post-tribulational in your interpretation, that those who dwell upon the earth refers to unbelievers. We'll see this as we move through the book of Revelation. You could check it in your concordance. When you get to chapter 17, those who dwell upon the earth are identified with those whose names are not written in the Lamb's book of life. These are the unbelievers. So the wrath of God in the seven-year tribulation is directed toward the unbeliever. But the very fact that this time encompasses the whole world, those who are believers on the earth will not be able to experience some of those consequences. For example, I read in the paper this week that there's a projection if something's not done, 40 million people on the continent of Africa will starve to death. Now, if you are a believer on that continent, you cannot escape the fact that you are living, living in a famine-scorched part of the world. That affects you. That will be true in the tribulation. Now, what is given here is a promise to the church to be kept out of that time. There's much discussion. I alluded to it in our discussion when we were doing this passage. I will keep you from the hour of testing. Some try to make this expression mean, I'll keep you while you're within it. Problems we're going to see in a moment. To do that creates a number of problems. Number one, we're going to see as we study Revelation, that a number so great you can't count of believers will be martyred in the tribulation.